I would look at my daily agenda. What do we already do? And it depends if it's elementary or secondary, obviously, Mm -hmm. but you know, is there a point in the day that I'm already doing with my layout that I can sneak in a five minute survey, five minute conversation? Mm -hmm. And where would that be? Hello there, and welcome to today's episode of the Easy EdTech Podcast. My name is Monica Burns, and I am so glad that you're here to join me today. If you want to make the most of education, technology, aka ed tech, while well, you are in the right place. My goal has always been to help make ed tech easier and give you ideas you can try yourself, share with a colleague, or bookmark for later in the school year. Every Tuesday here on the Easy Ed Tech podcast, you'll hear stories from my time in the classroom the work I do now with schools and districts, and my travels to different ed tech events. Get ready for solo episodes where I share some quick tips and stories and interviews full of practical ideas and stories from new guests each month. If we mention something you'd like to check out, make sure to click the link. You'll find it in the episode description or the summary area where you're listening to this podcast, or you can find every episode and all of the resources we mention by going to classtechtips.com slash podcast or by going to classtechtips.com and just clicking on the Easy Ed Tech podcast button at the top of the page. This episode is sponsored by the free stuff page on my website, classtechtips.com. This is where you'll find free weekly planner pages, graphic organizers, ebooks, and more. Just head to classtechtips.com and press the free stuff button at the top of the page to find lots of free downloads for you and your colleagues. That's classtechtips.com and press the free stuff button at the top of the page. This week's episode is titled Making Student Feedback Happen with Dr. Katie Began. Incorporating student feedback into your instructional planning can feel like a daunting task, especially when there's so many other things that are happening throughout the school day. But if you want your students to know that their voices are heard and increase buy-in this school year, it's worth sneaking in some questions as our guest, Dr. Katie Began suggests today. I came across a blog post she wrote for Edutopia all about this topic, and she was kind enough to join the podcast today to share some strategies to consider this school year. Let's dive into the conversation. Welcome to the podcast. I am so excited to chat with you today about all things student feedback. But before we jump in, can you share a bit about your role in education? What does your day-to-day look like? Hi, so I'm Katie Began, and the, my day-to-day is I teach five periods of biology for freshmen, and I teach one period of women's alliance. So it's a smaller class, but it's a great way to start the day for students who have typically struggled in the past academically. Wonderful. And, you know, knowing that you have a lot of students that you see right over the course mm-hmm. of the day, those different sections that you work with, excited to hear what you're kind of thinking about in terms of student feedback. I mentioned your Edutopia article earlier and hoping we can kick off with just a definition. You know, how would you define a cycle of student feedback and why is it important in the classroom? So I teach high school freshmen, and I think so often they're written off as not having valid opinions. And Mm -hmm. I just feel like that's not accurate, not only academically and social emotionally, but they're, they're just really insightful. And I think that we need to incorporate their opinions into instruction when we have the chance. So I try and just ask how they think things went. And it's something so simple. Uh, And it can really guide my instruction so that now I'm going to get more student buy-in. And students feel like they have a voice that's being heard. And that's really powerful. And it kind of starts us off on a really positive trajectory of success. And so that's what we're always aiming for, obviously, in education. And it's been this really exciting kind of small implementation that has made a very large impact, which 
for a busy teacher, that's what we're looking for. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Right. I can just, even as you're saying that, I'm thinking of like the checklist of all the things you're accomplishing, right? By right. adding in or emphasizing, right? The importance of student feedback, right? That student engagement, having them know that their opinions and voices are not just heard, but valued. And I love the framing too, to say like, this is a group, particularly, right? Your group of students, but it may be, you know, something teachers at different levels are seeing too, like, does that student feel like their voice is valued, generally speaking, right? Or in other parts of their school day. And if this is the space where they do feel heard, right? That's going to have a big impact in terms of their buy-in, just like you said. So, you know, what routines have you established to ensure student feedback is continuous and meaningful? The routines I have, I, in all aspects of education, I think that keeping things simple is the most effective way for longevity. We, we can go on Pinterest and we can see all these great things, but being able to implement them cleanly so the students are understanding and buying in and the teacher can keep it going throughout the year. It, it can be difficult. Yeah. So I just start the year off with a lot of connections. We do a lot of team building, a lot of getting to know you. So we already have that safe space. And that is important because sometimes, especially with teens, they can be hurtful with their words and not know it. Mm-hmm. So we, we definitely start off with the connection first has to happen. And then I start the conversation just very casual. Hey, what did you guys like about last week or this specific lab? And I get a little bit of feedback there. And as we go through the year, it ramps up a little bit mm-hmm. more, you know, and you're always going to get the student who has a silly answer and just kind of rolling past that because that's not productive. But it's also, you know, their frontal lobes aren't quite developed. So sometimes <laughs> they say things that they don't, they don't really mean. So just having that uh, open dialogue uh, and starting at the beginning, the healthy relationships and the safe place is so essential. But yeah, just making it casual and easy to implement and not a daunting task is very big and, and giving a reasoning. Hey, I really want to know what you guys thought of this lab. Do you like this style? Do you like that style? What would you do differently? And they always have good feedback and you're going to have a couple that speak more than others, but I've always gotten beneficial feedback. And just that idea of it being attainable, maybe not aspirational, like it's going to be this huge big thing, like, no, like keep it simple. And you're going to get information that is actionable, that you can really use. And I think what you said about just the commitment to like keeping it happening, like these small moments doesn't have to be super formal for it to be the thing, right? Like here, even these informal moments to be able to say, how did you feel? What did you think about this? But the fact that you're continuing to ask that question, right? It's not just a one and done, I think is such a a great part of establishing, right? This is a space, right? Where feedback is, is valued, right? And put into practice where they can kind of see that, you know, connection. So how do you encourage students to take ownership of their feedback when they're, you know, perhaps giving it to a, a peer or to you, right? But then also using feedback that they've received to improve their work or how they're interacting in a lab or a classroom space. Yeah, sometimes, well, kind of twofold. So sometimes they'll say things like, oh, I didn't like X, Y, Z in the classroom. And I'll say, can you explain why? And sometimes it's that they didn't try. They didn't put effort. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't have the buy-in. And so we'll have that safe conversation. Well, do you feel like, you know, you put your effort forth and got what I was trying to give to you through this lesson? And they'll say no. And I'll say, okay, so... Do you, should I change the style of instruction or should we change effort levels? And that is not as difficult as I thought. A lot of times you're like, oh, I should probably try harder. I'm like, great. <laughs> Glad we got to that <laughs> point. But I also try and use it individually. They will have like an essay that they wrote. And we're really big on incorporating literacy into science because those are two great connections we need. And I'll have the students share their work all the time with their peers and their peers give really great feedback. 
And so we're just creating cycles of feedback, big, small, you know, medium size. And there it's becoming more comfortable and less. I, I rarely have a student who feels like they're being attacked in their peer yeah. reviews. It's very comfortable. And I think it's very powerful because when they go into the workforce, who's going to be looking at their stuff up here. Uh-huh. So we just kind of create this comfort in change and feedback and change and feedback. And just that cycle keeps going and going all year long. And just having something that's continuous, right? That cycle. Right right, is a big part of making sure things feel safe and doable. And I think worth someone's time, right? If a student right. knows that this is a thing we're committed to, right? Not just oh, something that happens every once in a while, or like, yeah. ah, that's not, we're not really going to do that again, right? Why do I care about this? I just think that piece is, is so crucial. So could you tell us a little bit about any specific tech tools or platforms or websites that have been effective or, or helpful for providing feedback or, or part of this feedback cycle? Yeah, so we use Google Classroom at my school. And so I we're, we're always on it. We have the Google Slides, the, you know, they're on a doc, they're on forms. And I think forms is the one that I use the most. We do mm-hmm. a warm up. Every day when they come in, it's three questions, two content related, and then one social emotional question. So in that, they already have that routine. I can just throw a feedback question in there. Mm -hmm. Just keep it simple. I have seen someone use Padlet Mm -hmm. as a way to get feedback. And I love that because it can make that student who doesn't talk much put their input. Mm -hmm. But it can also take away maybe the holistic conversation component. So, you know, using that maybe together. So Mm -hmm. Padlet then conversation, I think would be great. Mm -hmm. And you could even do this in a Kahoot. You just sneak the question in there. Or what's that new one? Booklet. Mm -hmm. You can just slide the question in. (laughs) And so just making it something that's already part of your maybe tech usage, Mm -hmm. a part of your lessons, just kind of sneak that in there and then have the conversation later it is a really great way to get fast data. You could do like a Likert scale survey mm-hmm. and get maybe multiple points of data, or you could just do it in a short answer on a form or however you like a survey monkey type deal. So just simplicity, I think is key, but also bringing in that the student voice, like verbally in that conversation is also a great well-rounded approach for this cycle. Yeah. And those, you know, those pieces you said, those tips you shared are fantastic because it really is about keeping it simple and using the technology you already have, right? In your classroom, right? Maybe it's the Google classroom, maybe it's a learning management system that kids are already in, right? You might add in or sneak in that question, all right? That's not an everyday question, but could be built or layered on top of a routine. And I really like what you said about using it as a way to spark maybe the face-to-face conversation. Conversations. Like if you do your stop and jot, if you will, you know, on a Padlet space, or maybe right. that's recording your voice or typing something in, like you've got some data right there to start working off of. But it also gives kids that pause moment to say, all right, I already planned like what I'm going to tell the person sitting next to me and I've put it here, you know, in this space. So I think that's such a great piece of advice for someone who wants to leverage technology in these routines, maybe doesn't want to try something totally new, but has some options. And, you know, you mentioned the open-ended questions and the Likert scale. I mean, I think if someone uses Google Forms a lot, they're familiar with the Likert scale option. Can you unpack that a bit for listeners who maybe have seen it, but like wouldn't know exactly what you mean without a little more info? Yeah, a Likert scale just pairs an answer with a numerical piece. So, you know, we all do it. Give me a one to three. How are you feeling about today? So that's a Likert scale, but just verbal. So if you're more of a a quantitative person, putting that in as your question and using that as jumping ground is great. And you can you can compare data. Well, period three's average score was a four, or period five's was a six. So What's the difference? Am I teaching differently? Do they have different needs? Are they connecting more because it's after lunch, before lunch? Mm -hmm. So you can kind of go down a rabbit hole with questions. But yeah, I think 
sometimes our quantitative brains want numerical data. I'm more of a qualitative girl. So I, I want the conversation and I want to be taking notes myself and looking through maybe some short answers mm-hmm. and using that to gauge it. But, you know, you can always compare those. There's multi-method reasons for both. And yeah, so figuring out what works best for you. My husband is a, a quantitative person, so he would love a number. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I would love all the short answers. <laughs> and I want to read them all. <laughs> Yeah. Right. And it's just, it's funny as you're saying that I'm like envisioning the spreadsheet that a Google yeah. form right connects to. And we're using Google form kind of like you say Uber when you mean Lyft or taxi or like whatever, right. right? Like this could be something you do with a Microsoft form or survey monkey yeah. too. But when you are giving those questions, right, all the responses go into the spreadsheet. So, right. If you are more of a quantitative person, you can see all those numbers, maybe highlight that spreadsheet and get an average pretty quick. Yeah. Right. But even for uh, the qualitative data, which is kind of, I like a combo, I guess, but I really appreciate the short answers or the open ended responses too. You know, one thing, and of course, everyone's spelling is in different places, but if you do that control or command F, right, to find something and you type in like that one word that you think kids are saying or you've seen two or three times already, right, you can ask for it to highlight, right, or to find, and hence the F there, right, all of the time someone used that word, like church or like whatever it is, right? That might be part of a feedback piece. And so I think there's just so much you can get um, that feels really actionable, which is the whole point of collecting data in the first place. Like there's no point in collecting this if we're not going to use it (laughs) in some way. So I think that that's just really advice for someone who's like, what kind of question? And it might come back to how you're going to interact with that data, you know, in, in the first place. So, you know, Key, I know you mentioned about keeping it simple, right? And leaning into some of the tools that you already have access to. So for someone who's listening today and is just starting to incorporate regular feedback cycles, maybe they, you know, committed to that as part of their professional goals for this year. They're realizing the kids they're working with this school year are really, you know, need to talk a bit more, right? Or maybe it's not happening organically um, in terms of giving feedback. For someone who's just starting to incorporate regular feedback cycles into their practice, what advice would you give to them? I think two points of advice. The first one is I would look at my daily agenda. What do we already do? And it depends if it's elementary or secondary, obviously, Mm -hmm. but you know, is there a point in the day that I'm already doing with my layout that I can sneak in a five minute survey, five minute conversation? Mm -hmm. And where would that be? The next thing I would do is look up some sentence frames or create your own to help facilitate the conversation. So students sometimes feel like we're trying to trick them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I don't know where that comes from. Maybe it's just the age. But if you have that sentence frame and it's kind of aligned with your overall goals, that will help them understand, hey, I can use a sentence frame and I can express myself because she's she or he's giving me the sentence frame. They this is what they're looking for. I've had students when I have the cycle of review conversation say, like something about the schedule. I can't change the schedule. So, like the the school schedule. Mm-hmm. But I can focus on this. So, like the sentence frame could be along the lines of, I really liked this style lesson or whatever, because I think that we can make adjustments to this style lesson Mm -hmm. because not, I think we need different lunch, lunch schedules. (laughs) That's out of my control. Mm -hmm. And I think that is really about setting up kids for success, right? In these moments too, right? So that if you're asking them questions, you want to make sure that you can respond, right? In a way, right? That they know that, you know, this information that you've gathered really is, is meaningful, right? That you're asking Mm -hmm. these questions for them with intention, you know, yeah. So such great tips. So for people who are listening in today, I'm going to link out to some of your online resources um, where people can, you know, follow along with your work, but for someone who is on the go or on the move today, and it's just kind of making a mental bookmark, where can they connect with you? Where can people learn more about your work? 
So I am on Instagram. It's Teacher Beegs, B-E-E-G-E-S, because my last name's Began. I'm also on LinkedIn if you're looking for a professional connection. I'm currently looking for a school to do a replication study with my dissertation focused on high school freshmen. Mm-hmm. And I'm also on Amazon Workbooks. I have three workbooks on there. One focused on high school freshmen, one focused on teachers navigating their first year in the classroom, and one focused on teachers thinking of leaving the classroom. So kind of a bookend situation there. But yeah, so three workbooks out, and I uh, often have articles on Edutopia and Source coming out. Perfect. So we will link out to all of that so people can find you and connect with you. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. I appreciate it. It was so much fun chatting with Katie today. And I want to finish up this episode like we always do with a few key points for making this ed tech easy. Incorporating student feedback can increase student buy-in. Use existing tools to integrate feedback into daily routines. Combine both numerical data and open-ended responses. Establish simple and consistent feedback routines, making it easier to sustain. Remember, you can find the show notes and full list of resources from today's episode, including all of the ways to connect with Dr. Katie Began by heading to classtechtips.com slash podcast. This episode is sponsored by the free stuff page on my website, classtechtips.com. This is where you'll find free weekly planner pages, graphic organizers, ebooks, and more. Just head to classtechtips.com and press the free stuff button at the top of the page to find lots of free downloads for you and your colleagues. That's classtechtips.com and press the free stuff button at the top of the page. Thank you for listening to this new episode of the Easy EdTech Podcast. I love creating new episodes for you each week, but I could use a bit of help spreading the word about the podcast. Can you leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app? Spotify will let you tap on the stars and Apple Podcasts will let you tap on the stars and leave a one or two sentence review. Thank you so much for taking this extra step. It helps other educators find episodes like this one when they're searching for EdTech tips.